Hi everyone, in section 5.1 we're going to be looking at the introduction to normal distributions and the standard normal distribution. Okay. In this chapter we will now be focusing primarily on continuous probability distributions and the distribution will be a smooth bell-shaped curve. As an example, if we took the heights of 100 males and we recorded those values and graphed them, we would see a very familiar shape, look something kind of like this. We call that a symmetric distribution earlier in the class, where we see that there's a most common value of the mode here would be a height of about 5.75 feet. And as you go either from the left or from the right of that, that mode, that the values kind of decrease in a symmetrical kind of fashion. And what we get is a bell-shaped curve. Okay. Wherever the highest point on the bell occurs at, on the x-axis, that is going to be the mean. And this graph will continue infinitely far to the left and infinitely far to the right. It will approach the horizontal axis asymptotically, but it will never cross it and it will never touch it. Okay. So the normal probability distribution, this is the most common continuous probability distribution that there is. And the reason for this is because many real life variables are normally distributed. Things like reading ability, job satisfaction, heights, cholesterol levels, blood pressures, lifespans, etc. tend to be normally distributed. A couple key properties of the normal distribution is that the mean, median, and mode are all equal to each other. And again, they kind of occur wherever that highest point of the, the bell is at. That value on your independent axis, that's the, the mean. It's going to be symmetric with respect to the mean, meaning that if you draw a vertical line that passes through the mean, it'll cut that bell-shaped curve into two equal pieces. They would be the mirror image of each other with respect to that vertical line. And the other thing that's going to be important is that the total area under the curve is going to be equal to 1, which is equivalent to 100% of the data value. Okay. Inflection points, while they are important, we will not focus so, so much on them in terms of this course. Uh, but one of the things that you definitely want to know about the normal distribution is, again, that it extends infinitely far to the left and to the right. It should never, ever cross that horizontal axis. Okay. In general, what two numbers will define and make up any normal distribution is the value of the mean and the standard deviation. Okay. The way in which kind of these affect the shape of the bell is that the mean will tell you precisely where the peak of the bell will occur at. If I look at these three graphs, let's call them from left to right, graph one, graph two, and graph three, the one that would have the largest mean would be this graph over here because it lies the most to the right. This one would have the second largest mean and because the peak of this bell occurs over here to the left, it would have the smallest of the three means. One of the things that we spent a lot of time focusing on in the second section of this course was standard deviation. And we recall that what standard deviation is, is a measure of dispersion. So the larger a standard deviation, the more spread out the data values were. The smaller the standard deviation, the closer the individual values were in a data set. Okay. So if we try to compare these three graphs based upon their standard deviation, the one that would be the most spread out, which would be this one here in the middle, because it's the most spread out, it has the most dispersion, this one would have the largest standard deviation. This one is kind of uh, in between these two in terms of spread outness, so this would have the middle standard deviation. And if you look at this normal distribution over here to the right, it's kind of like very sharp and spiky-like, and that indicates that all of these values are relatively close to where the mean is at, so this graph would have the smallest dispersion or the smallest standard deviation of all three. So as we move through this entire chapter, one of the biggest things that you're gonna to have to keep in mind is whenever we say normal distribution, immediately your mind should go to asking this question. Okay, I have a normal distribution. What is its mean and what is its standard deviation? Okay. Couple important things. We also want to remember that the area under the curve is going to be equal to 1, or as a percentage, it would be 100%. And we know this from properties of the normal distribution. We've worked with this kind of curve before, back when we did the empirical rule. 
The empirical rule said, if you remember, that 68% of the data would lie within one standard deviation to the left or to the right of the mean, that 95% would lie within two standard deviations of the mean, and that 99.7% of the data set would lie within three standard deviations of the mean. And we had our z-score formula allow us to kind of calculate the, the z-score for values. The z-score for an x-score was x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. We focused on many problems earlier where we founded percentages under the curve um, for various types of z-scores from negative three, negative two, all the way up to positive three. And what we're gonna do is kind of extend those concepts now in this section to include fractional z-scores as well. Before we do so, just kind of summarizing real quick. Again, if you look at the cumulative area, it's gonna be close to zero if your z-score is close to negative 3.49, when we use that buzzword cumulative area, that always refers to the area to the left of a z-score. So when we say area to the left, that's the cumulative z-score. As the cumulative area increases, as the z-score increases, meaning as your z moves to the right, we capture more and more area to the left, and so it's going to increase. If the total area is one and you split it right down the middle, that means that half would lie to the left of the mean and half would lie to the right of the mean. And then for the standard normal distribution, if you go to a z-score of 3.49, namely over here, almost all or close to one of the area would lie to the left of that particular z-score. Okay? This particular standard deviation, excuse me, this particular normal distribution, which is called the standard normal, is a very special one. It's the one that has a mean that's equal to zero and a standard deviation equal to one. If we look at the following examples, they give us three different graphs. And the question is, could any one of these represent a normal distribution? The first one would not be because it crosses the, the horizontal axis there. So that would rule it out, even though it's bell-shaped it doesn't meet all of the, the requirements. The graph in the middle here, number two, is not um, bell-shaped at all, so it would not be a normal distribution. And the graph in three, that would actually satisfy all of the requirements. It's nice and symmetric, it's a bell, and it asymptotically approaches the x-axis to the left and to the right. So this one here would satisfy and be a graph of a normal distribution. One of the things that we want to do, kind of analogous to when we were working on the empirical rule, is we want to be able to find the area under this normal curve from uh, one z value to another. And that's going to be with a brand new command called the normal CDF command. On both the TI 83 and 84, it's going to be found in the same location. If I just turn my calculator on, it's going to be under the distribution menu, which would be the second VARS key. And then for us, it's gonna be option two. We want to use normal CDF. Okay. The way the normal CDF function works is that it accepts four inputs and they have to go in this order. The lower bound of the region you're looking for, the upper bound, the mean, and then the standard deviation. If you're using a TI-84 or a TI-84 plus, it has a nice, uh, menu that will kind of remind you and prompt you for those values. It says lower, upper, mean, and standard deviation. For those of you using the TI-83, if I go back into this menu, if I go second distribution and hit normal CDF, then what it will do is it'll put that command on your home screen and you have to remember to put those four numbers in order separated by, by commas. For example, let's suppose we wanted to compute the probability that a z-score is between negative 2.05 and positive 2.05. I can go to my normal CDF command. The lower bound is going to be the negative 2.05. The upper bound is going to be positive 2.05. Because we're working with a z-score, Z-scores specifically are from the standard normal distribution, which means that the mean will be zero, 
and the standard deviation will be one. Go ahead and I post this, post, paste this on the home screen. At this stage here, for those of you using the 83, you can see what that input should look like. You're gonna have normal CDF, and then it's my lower bound, and then a comma, which is your directly above the seven, 2.05, that's the upper bound, comma, the mean, comma, standard deviation, and then go ahead and hit enter. Typically, we will be rounding these to four decimal places, so this would round to 0.9596. Okay. It's possible that our regions might be unbounded, either to the left or to the right. If that is the case, then we need to kind of use a fill-in number for um, that idea of approaching a negative infinity or a positive infinity, since they themselves are not real numbers. What we will use, this is a little bit different from the notes, is we will use negative one E, this is gonna be the second comma key, 99. This will be our placeholder for something like a negative infinity when the region is unbounded to the left. And we will use a one second comma positive E99 if the region is unbounded to the right and would approach positive infinity. Let's take a look at the first one. It says use a calculator to find the area that corresponds to the given z-scores. They say to the left of z equals 0 0.25. One of the things that I can't recommend strongly enough is whenever you're doing these, if you can draw a sketch of the bell shape in the region that you're looking for, a lot of times that'll kind of help you uh, to be able to kind of set things up and to be able to determine what is the left bound and what is the right bound. Again, we're working with a z-score, so this is a standard normal. So I know whenever I draw my bell shape curve, the, the mean should correspond to zero. A z-score of positive 0.25 would lie a little bit to the right of that. And they're asking for the area to the left. So I would shade everything to the left of 0.25. So this is the area I'm looking for. And one of the things we're gonna focus on heavily in this chapter is if you're looking for area, that's going to be that normal CDF command. So we're gonna to go to second, distribution, go down to option two, normal CDF. My lower bound, because this region goes all the way to the left, the lower bound is gonna be negative one E99. So I'm gonna put negative one, and then second comma to get the E99. The right bound of this region, this region extends as far to the right, but it stops at that positive 0.25, so that's 0.25. We have a standard normal because it's a z-score, which means a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Go ahead, we'll paste it, hit enter, and we should get to four decimal places, 0 0.5987, 0 0.5987. Let's take a look at the next one. In example two, they want us to find the area to the right of z equals 2.33. Once again, it's a great idea. You wanna get into these good habits, just draw a sketch of it. Here's my bell-shaped curve. I see that they say z-score, that's synonymous with the standard normal. So again, I'm gonna have a, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. A z-score of 2.33 would be somewhere over here to the right of zero, just roughly about here. And we're looking for the area to the right of that. So I would shade everything to the right. I'm now gonna to go to the calculator once I have my graph done. I go to second, distribution, normal CDF. From looking at my graph, I see that the shaded region extends as far to the left as 2.33. So that's my lower bound. It's gonna go all the way to the right towards positive infinity. So I'm gonna use one second comma E 99 for my upper bound, mean of zero, standard deviation of one. Go ahead and hit paste, hit enter, and we will see that that area to the right to four places would be 0 0.0099. 